feel like I'm betraying this. <laughs> You're betraying <laughs> the Spawn near the other Claudettes. Huntress, honey mommy. That man. She's awfully loud. On the gen near uh, Killer Shack. And one of the exit gates. Uh, there's sort of an arch. The Brandberg Gate. Of, uh... what, are, what are Napoleon's arches called again? Yeah, the Arctic Triumph, yeah. Got a little Arctic Triumph over here. Yeah, I think I'm by it too. I feel like the most Roman thing ever to do, to build an arch to commemorate a, a victory. It is the Roman thing to do. And they declared Napoleon Augusta, Augustus Europa. <laughs> Not France, of the French. <laughs> By declaring his empire, he basically made the nation state happen. That's me. <laughs> we may have, like I know that like yeah, he's like a very like nationalistic time, but what exactly makes it like the first na like nation and state, they're um they're the same thing kinda. Ooh, that is a rabbit hole that I don't think my tummy could bear. Or do you mean nation as in like a people, like or, or ethnic group, and state as in the government, right? The government, like uh... in, like you know, like the, like France, you know, with the revolution, with the, like with the revolution, it you know made it its first snap, basically, from monarchy, right? Yeah. With this extreme republicanism that rose up, basically, and then you know Napoleon comes and. You know, for the sake of, especially for the sake of, you know, exercising power as well as, you know, trying to, you know, affirm legitimacy in the eyes of, you know, the various empires and kingdoms of Europe. Um, you know, with declaring himself emperor, he made an important distinction. Like, he didn't declare himself emperor of France. <laughs> He basically worded it as Emperor of the French to signify, you know, that this was a continuation of the ideals of the, the, the French Revolution. It's just, you know, like we're really going we're really going Roman about it basically. And that was that was Napoleon, that was the whole thing. He was going for, you know, the Augustus take. Because it was both imperial and republican. Yeah. I mean even um you know, even Augustus, he never called himself uh, emperor in that sense, you know. Imperator, yes, as in, like, he's the commander-in-chief of the army. The legions. Fuck you. Okay, this Huntress is dumb. Or, you know, I, mean, I, I can't tell. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a basic... I don't know, it's just my basic summary of it. Mm -hmm. Just a second. There 
the letter he gets. Like, right before his... Oh no, when he comes back from uh, St. Elba. From Mount... Uh, They send them a letter basically stating that, you know, we declare Napoleon uh, as our enemy. Uh, we declare war against Napoleon, not against France, not against the French, against Napoleon. And then somebody goes, you know, they honor, oh, they honor you, sire. They, be, they practically declare you a country. Yeah. It's like the state. I I am the Senate. <laughs> but they used to do like even in but even kings did that before, like in Hamlet, right? When they say something is rotten in the state of Denmark, they're referring to the They're referring to the royal family, because it's like the the monarchy is the state. I right? thought royal family is is it only the monarchy? Is it only the royal family? Is the monarchy considered as only the royal family? Or do we also consider, you know, the people that work for it? I mean, like... Like, if you look over in the East, mm -hmm. especially with the Turks, the Ottomans, and the Mongols, and, you know, especially with Central Asian empires, you know, mm -hmm. we use the word devlet a lot. And that was used basically from, you know, anywhere from a tribe to an emirate, which is basically a kingdom on its own, to a principality, to a empire. It was basically like an extension of this old imperial system, like the Sassanid okay. system, as they so, call it. You know, well, ba you know, it's like the Persians. So the way, the way, the way that the, I understand it in Europe, right, is that people believed in divine right and stuff like trial by combat, right? Like if if people wanted, yeah. the idea was that if this family was the strongest and most powerful and took over, it was that way because God wished it so, right? And this was enforced by bishops and popes, right? Uh, crowning, crowning kings, right? It was that, it was the, you know, that the church supported this, right? And this is why Napoleon, right, for instance, had to kidnap the pope, have him beat up, right, to, you know, declare a member. Oh, no, but I think, didn't he end up putting the crown on his own head or something in the end, right? He, like, I forget, it was like he set it all up, right? And then said in the end, just decide. Oh, I don't even need you to crown me. I'm gonna crown myself because. I mean Napoleon. I think so. It, or it was. If it wasn't him, yeah. then maybe it could have. If it wasn't yeah, him, Napoleon it could have been this. Uh, there was. I remember this was this like African uh, dictator who declared like an empire, and he copied Napoleon and he spent all this money on this. Oh, freaking Henry Barossa of the Central African yeah. Empire. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Unless I'm thinking about him, but I thought I thought he, I thought it was either he had done that based on what Napoleon had done. I remember watching this video. It's uh, this YouTube channel. It's called New Africa. I talked to yeah, I guess like contemporary African history and stuff. And uh, pretty much inspired Napoleon. And, oh my fucking god! It just ends up so But um. Yeah, the whole thing basically just to show the, uh, the whole idea of, you know, the separation of, you know, religion and state. He had the Pope there basically to show, you know, that, you know, I'm like... He can, he can be the bitch I boy and sign the papers, know. right? But... <laughs> but uh, well, he wasn't, he wasn't an idiot. Like, he knew that, you know, the Pope still held sway and there was a legitimacy and... Yeah. That, you know, during the revolution, it got crazy. Like, they were freaking guillotining priests left, right, and center. It got that bad, like by the bushel, basically. And so, you know, with the violence of the revolution in mind, he basically wanted to say, hey, I'm imperial, so you guys get that. But also, you know, we're, we're continuing, we're an empire of laws, basically. An empire of, of an ideal of the constitution, basically, you know, revolutionary Republican empire. We're bringing back Rome, modern style for them. It was modern, I guess. The in the East, the whole you know the whole concept of a state really was based around what the Persians did, mm -hmm. and that was the whole you know you've probably heard the saying "King of Kings" basically, 
Yeah, Ozymandias. Yeah, look on my works in despair. Basically, you know, it was that, um, uh, what was it called again? The magic, like a major, majocratic mm. type of deals. These are papers. Magi. Or whatever you have it, you know, basically. That's what the Persians Not had, I thought. The, they were, they yeah, were, but they I were mean, like an intellectual class, right? They're a middle class of sorts, right? Well, you know, you have a you have a religious class, of course, you know. You have a religious class, I'm guessing. But um, but also like w with the Ottomans, especially, it was like you know, take that Persian system of like you know, just centralized power and distributed responsibilities, basically. You know, like kings, you know, could still be ruled by a king of kings, basically. Like the whole Persians were big on the fact of like you know, you fight territory or you take over it peacefully, whatever have you. But you basically make, you know, the classic deal of, you you know, wherever I rule, you know, my vassals, they're basically the kings of their original lands, but they're my vassals, plain and simple. They pay a bit of the pat, a bit of the tax, and, you know, give a portion of manpower to the army. And with that being said, you know, it, it was the model, basically, that was the model of a state, you know, and no matter who anyone was, basically, no matter what cultures picked up, what other peoples picked up, especially the Turks, it was like, you know, it remained unchanged, basically, you know? The Ottoman Empire, it was like, oh, fuck. Like, a lot of positions, all f hinging on one individual, the Sultan himself. And, you all, and with that in mind, you also have, like, elements of Chinese legalism as well because the Turks had been, you know, they, they were in contact with Chinese civilization prior and prior into entering basically the Middle East and, you know, the region of what we know as Persia and then later on into Anatolia and whatnot. Legalism was in place as well. So it's like, you know, for me, a state is like... Um, a government's a government, but a state is like, you know... If it, if governments are walking the walk and talking the same talk, it's a state. Did um did Napoleon have a constitu like? I know that English law has often been based off of. And one of the things I learned, learned in school, yeah, is that English law is based on like the Magna Carta, constitutionalism, and common law. But French and Quebec is like this too. Their legal system is based more on civil law. So I don't know if they have as much the. Do they have as much constitutionalism, or is it kind of... I don't know. Well, I mean, Napoleon basically make, made a civil code from scratch. Like, that's why they call it the Napoleonic Code. Yeah, the Napoleon. And, like, like for instance, Louisiana, in Louisiana, mm -hmm. um, that's still in effect. Like, yeah. Louis, the Code of Louisiana, the Civil Code of Louisiana is basically the Napoleonic Code, you know, due to its history. Yeah. So, um... It's like that's that's created some interesting conundrums, you know, given given the fact that Louisiana has its law as a state, but then you know there's like the federal, you know, what does the federal government have to say about it? Mm -hmm. It's like the levy. It's like the land over there basically belongs to somebody, and then basically the you know the the land beyond the levy belongs to everybody. That's the Napoleonic Code, as was described by guy in a book i think it was mark Twain. it's like so um. le code napoleon officially the civil code of the french established under french consul in 1804 and still in force although frequently amended it was drafted by a commission of four eminent jurists and entered into force on 21st of march 1804 the code, with its stress on clearly written and accessible law, was a major step in replacing the previous patchwork of feudal laws. So, yeah, with with these amendments, it was basically like France basically, you know, left the medieval era. And it wasn't the first legal code to be established in, in a European country with a civil law legal system. Um, actually, Bavaria ended up doing it first.
before in mm. 1756, and then Prussia in 1794, and then the West, and then Galicia, basically, which was basically Western Austria in 1797. However, Napoleonic Code was like the first modern legal code to be adopted with a pan-European scope in mind, because Napoleon was, yeah, he wasn't kidding when he was trying to, you know, take over Europe. He was like, this guy had plans. Yeah. He's gonna export la révolution. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pee. Right over. Yeah, it was like... It's interesting. The categories of Napoleonic Code were not drawn from earlier French laws, but from... Uh, you know, Justinian. The Justinian. Damn, that guy was Byzantine. That's fucked. He basically... He was big. He recodified a Roman law into the Corpus Juris Civilis and within it the Institutes. Institutes basically divide law into the law of one, persons, two, things, three, actions. Similarly, the, the Civil Code of France divided law into four sections. Persons, property, acquisition of property, and civil procedure. In 1806, they moved that uh, civil procedure into a separate code. So, before Napoleonic Code, France did not have a single set of laws, but basically local customs. You know, there's a duchy the, here, a principality there, a dukedom there, and such and such. Yeah, I know one thing that like they brought in with the revolution was um was like uh like a lot. Of, yeah, I'd say certain aspects of like feminism and like divorce was a big thing, right? Because like, well, I don't know, because there was the there was the Protestant Reformation too, but Protestants don't really Protestants don't really believe in divorce either, or at least they believe it's a sin, right? Currently in Louisiana because Napoleonic yeah. Code's in effect there, um, they practice forced airship. You have to go oh. oh no, we have, we have a top hat death slinger. Stove pipe. It's got the fucking pipes. Oh no. Oh. Man, nobody got pipes like I do.
up right now in Killer Shark. Ah, uh, there's a gen near me that I'll go on to. Okay, the nets. Zen. Z3N. We're still where we were before. Yep. Be right there. But actually, no. The, oh, fuck. No, he's here. Damn it. Never mind. And outside main building. On the side opposite to the killer shack. Sense. You're close by the guy who was up? Yeah. Oh yeah, maybe you should get him, yeah. I think uh, killer's on me and the uh, string. So. Oh, radio blurs. Son of a bitch. Shit. Alright, yeah, it's got time. I think he's on. I think he's going for that. Uh, going for his obsession. <laughs> right now. Got the unhack on the radio?
in it. Guys, let me take the hits from now on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're running that protection game. That's smart. I bet he had BB King and Shelly. Because the scratch marks would not have lasted that long. <laughs> Blurs on a generator. We have Jack in the chase. Zen is cleansing a hexter. Okay. Uh. first took. Okay, hex totem down. Radio Blur is almost completely generated. Uh, it's currently chasing Zen. I think Radio Blur is moving. Looks like he's moving you towards you. He's moving towards the Zen. Zen's still in the chase. But it looks like he's gonna break away. Blur's now focusing on Radio Blur. Radio Blur continues to move towards the unhook. Then flipping away, looks like he's also heading towards the unhook. Probably unaware. Hops into a locker, hops right back out. Then Harpoon. Oh no, it's Radio Blur. All right, Jack, don't forget to mend. Jack, mend, mend. Jack, mend. Good. 
If you don't do that, you'll go into dying state when the time ends. Up. Xanus off to the dead on hunt. Radio blur finish mending. Radio blur is now healing with self care. Spine chill on Jack. Ah, yeah. Sorry, right. we got one more hook state. It's not over yet. What radio play? Why is he hiding in that? Oh, because of the BBQ and chili. Smart, smart. Radio blue hides in the locker. He waits. For the hook is done. Radio blur. Let's go. Oh, I guess he wants to give it a. Yeah, it gives the full four seconds. Okay. Smart. Smart. Oh, he's on radio blue. Med kit is empty. It's got borrowed time though. You can just get to the unhook. Have another shot. Unhook. Something run, Jack. Oh, fuck. Let him let him pull you in. Let him pull you in. You have borrowed time. Now run, 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 run. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Okay. Do all you can do. Labelers on the gym. Getting off. He looking for the hatch. He should be looking for the Oh, he drops. He drops the body is bait. Jack is in recovery mode right now. Radio blur is hiding in a locker. The killer comes by the locker but does not check it. Alright, he might he might just get you up. Alright, Radio Blur is exiting the locker. He's coming over towards Jack. Jack is almost fully recovered. So Beautiful. It's blind chill active. Killer back in the main building. Um, there's... Radio Blur is healing himself right now. I think you guys are both safe right now. Um, if you can get to him, he can probably get you. He's near the completed Jenny, outside of the tower, and uh, near the exit gate. Okay, well, I guess I'll let the killer leave first, or he do anything. Okay, Radio Blur is coming in the building. You should go to him. He's, he's inside the building. Drop down. Perfect. Yeah, come on, Radio. Let's go. Heal them up. Man, the Ember's not giving up yet. So if you guys stick together, you guys can probably speed through some Jennies. So, say so stick together, probably follow him. Okay, shit, killer. It's killer. You guys gotta go. Start running. Holy shit, so much Nice, nice spot, nice stun, nice stun, nice stun. I 
Because you're there, man. Yeah, I was seeing your scratch marks. I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to make use of the urban invasion, and that's smart, but... See if you can break the chain. See if you can break the chain. Oh, no. Does he pick you up this time? Uh, he doesn't. This time he doesn't try to use his bait. Hang around, we find a hook. Though he's got a hook in his sights. It's not looking good for Jack. Radio blur hiding in a locker. Smart. He's waiting for the BBQ and Chili to pass. If I had thought of this, uh, that would have been, that would might have saved me. Radio blur going for the hatch. Wanna see what happens. Check him by a killer shack. Doesn't seem like hatch is there. Killers found the hatch first. It's a race to the exit. Go blur. He's going a long way around to the boom. Trying to avoid the killer sights. Exit gates aren't too far away. This is gonna be tough for Radio Blur. With that long range attack, it's not gonna be easy to hold down. Radio, is he waiting for. I think he might be waiting for a to check it. Or not, he's going for the gate. Passing 25% on the gate. Getting closer. Pushing past 50. But the killer sees him. The harpoon misses. He's not close enough. Can he get the interrupt? He stabs. And radio blue. Oh, he almost makes it. That's a... Three. Oh, sorry, that was a, that was a, oh. it was a gold one. Uh, killer. It's probably personal. Here isn't it? No, actually, no BBQ in Chile. He had, he he had hexed Oh, no, he's the nurse's calling. So. Not BBQ. Man. Guess I shouldn't have ruled that out. Good bird. Chili steak at home. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Just calling me up, seeing how I was. I asked him like if we he brought anything over. Like, yeah, 
Yeah, we're on some slabs of fillet. I'll do one more match. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go for um, I'm gonna go for a little blitz mechanic. Yeah. Yeah, what perks are you uh, switching out then, I guess? But, uh, um, well, you're just talking about the toolbox. Just the toolbox. Really oh, doesn't okay. Matter yeah, that's fine. Although well, I could do streetwise. Oh, yeah, it reduced it. This affects me as well, right? Like, say if I'm by myself, I'm working, I'm using, I'm mm -hmm. consuming an item, right? Yeah. The streetwise still don't affect. Yeah, yeah, it affects you and all other survivors. Oh, bless. Alrighty, yeah. I can't beat that 25%. And not with, uh, not resilience. Resilience is good, but it's just like... Yeah, I know. <laughs> percent speed, I said. It's actually not bad. Especially if you open chests, then you can get an even more of you. Um, yeah. More value out of your streetwise. Or if other, like, if, um, let's say a survivor, another survivor comes and heals you with a med kit, right? Now their med kit's not going to use up as much, right? Yeah. Uh, it can make flashlights last longer, you find, like, a flashlight or something. Uh, or a map or any. The thing is, like, what I like about Streetwise is that it works for any item, which means that whatever you find in a chest will be improved by Streetwise. Oh, that's sick. I don't even know. Yeah. It's not just the item you start with, it's, yeah, any survivor, items, survivors nearby. So. Good. So, Napoleonic code is basically... Mm -hmm. Nobody owns the land between the levee and the river. It is the property of all the people. That's the Napoleonic Code. You lease it from the people, represented by the Port Authority, or the levee board. That's the Municipal Code, explains Tubby Dubonet, referring to New Orleans, Louisiana. In Lucky Man at 2013 on Tony Dunbar. Man, do you do we really want to talk about Salic Law? If I was you, I would say yeah. no. Oh, no, I say yes. Yeah. For no. the stream, man. No, for the stream, freaking. For the, yeah, oh, for we the stream, the man. No, we're live, man. Holy hell! Well. I'm, I'm publishing, yeah, this episode of story time with Jack, right? This is your lecture time, man. You're the professor. <laughs> That's just a frig. Friggin' salad law. I still don't understand it. It was basically this... It was a civil law code written like five... Exactly 500 years after Christ was born mm -hmm. by the first Frankish king, Clovis. And it's like... I don't know. It drives me insane. Every time I read about this shit, it drives me insane. Like, how? Mm -hmm. It's like all these tribes of Europe just like, they just came into contact with the whole concept of civil laws and then all of a sudden it's like, God damn. Yeah, he po he politically law. modernized a lot of Europe. Boom! It's like tribes becoming kingdoms, basically. You know, you have, you have laws, you have codes, 
rules. And you dispose of a lot of the old, well, a lot of the old order because there were a lot of other European monarchies that he overthrew. Right? The monarchies didn't really like that France could just get rid of their king like that, right? But this is even this is way before France. This is the beginning of France, my guy. This is France here. This is this was written by Clovis the First, King of all the Franks. This was right at the end of like this was right when I guess, you know this was right when the Roman Empire in the West was collapsing, basically. It's like a hundred years afterwards, one could say. It's like, you know, as the Roman Empire fell, all of these tribes and peoples and king, you know, these dukedoms were basically just like, you know, they had this concept of, hey, there's such a thing as law. We can codify it. And it just set you guys on fire. In our, in the case of the East, tribes, well, they were, for one part, they were mainly nomadic. Mainly so. From the beginning, I mean the exception being that, like, you know, I mean, you had the Ostrogoths, you had the Visigoths as well. Um, one Germanic people that later on became a full fledged out kingdom because, you know, the Romans tried basically by fucking him in the deal. Something, 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 you know, help us out. Oh, fuck. Anyways, I think we're back on track with this Jenny that I'm working on with, uh, and the mouse from the sea joy for over here. Yeah, I got the I got the other mate with me. So, uh, Again, there's the mask on, you know. Yeah. Masked mags, yeah. Yeah. So oh my goodness, I'm done. That was too much heat. That was too much heat. No, fuck I wanna beat you. I'm gonna beat you up. No. No, get over here. Get over here! You're gonna swipe at me? Asshole! Okay, I think I duped him into being like, whoa, what the hell? He's running at me and said, wait for me. That's the bait. You haunted him. I was so pissed it worked. <laughs> yeah, he interrupted me. Little K pop shite. to do, especially with the pro knives. Quick succession. Um, but yeah, Salad Law was like really friggin' complex. It's like, you know, Salad Law basically states that, you know, which, there was one feature of Salad Law where it influenced like the entirety of European monarchic law where it was like, you know, the land Salad shall not pass to through, you know, female line something like that it was like, like it was made such to the point where you know literally 500 years after it was made it was like you know the law basically stated there's a lot of things that kingdoms are doing that they're not supposed to do but it's like kingdoms are like okay we might be relatives but fuck it fam you know we might be cousins, but you know, he's England and I'm France. So Salaclaw, as you can, as you can say. Oh, son of a bitch, he was right there. Asshole. Okay, I blocked him. He was right at the bottom. I just landed on the floor, he's right there. But, um... So yeah, I basically made these... These complexities. I mean, like I, I look at here in the streets, like you know, there's duchy, there's all these duchies within principalities, within kingdoms. It's like, say. Well, because sometimes if a family, depending on how many kids they have, they might have to divide up the land between the different kids, right? Ah, uh, it's true. true. There and her it's it's hereditariness, like. All these titles yeah. and stuff are all hereditary. Right? They're all family based. Yeah. Well, so. yeah. well, in the East, um, I'll give you Turks as an example. Their monarchic law was basically, uh, 
to the strongest, to the most capable. So I, you know, it didn't matter whether the sons fought it out or agreed amongst themselves. Basically, it was not like only one could do. Yeah. Like it was basically Highlanders. There can be all in the yeah, it was it was Darwinian as heck, and the whole concept of like kingdoms for, I guess for you know, a lot of Eastern kingdoms was. Plenty of vassalship, but it wasn't based on like, you know how like you say in Europe, you know, there was a the whole co code of conduct and chivalry and such and such. Yeah. Well, in the East, it was you know. Ultimately depended up upon you know customs and rules and for the Ottomans it could be said that you know Islam itself certainly had Islam had, is, is, is is like chivalry, right? It's well, like no, a Bushido in of itself, that, right? It's it's not that exactly it's like if you read the Quran you'll notice one thing. It's legalist as fuck. Yeah. Like they went, they went over those freaking details. I mean that, that Christ didn't. So with that effect, it was like you know there was a code of conduct with regards. To, there were rules of engagement basically in Islam. Yeah. You know, as in, like, like for instance, um, Islam supported the whole thing of you know right before the final siege, at least have a final chat. You know, yeah. set up terms before you're gonna do the be all end all, you know. Like, it wasn't like complete, you know, kill them, believers, completely, such and such. Like, there was also like rules on, you know, pillaging. Like, customarily, it's like, you know, three days. You give three days to your troops at maximum for looting. Any more than that is just like. Could be overkill, couldn't be overkill, but you know, it's like that's pretty much a sin. It gets. It's. It's much. It's too much considering that, you know, you're already like allowing your soldiers to. Yeah. Whatnot. Uh, I remember, what was what was this movie called? I think it was called like Black Gold, and of all people to play the Arab King was Antonio Banderas, right? But there was like one of the things they were saying in the. There was like. And it, it basically plays that out, right? It's like, well, similar like that, yeah. So it's like these Saudi princes, right? Or fight, kings are like fighting each other. And it's when oil is first discovered in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And it, anyway, the thing they said was that anything that is worth of value was won through love or war. Right? And, and so that's like yeah. one of the line that they keep saying in the game. So, you, like, I mean, bear in mind too that. Arabs existed before Islam as well. Mm -hmm. So for, you know, for people, it's just a matter of knowing of the fact that there is a distinction between Arabic culture and, and Islam. Islamic culture as a whole. I mean, and yeah, I mean, you know, Islamic culture as a whole, you're literally talking about the whole Islamic world. So you're talking about Saudi Arabia, you're talking about Turkey, you're talking about Bosnia, you're talking about Indonesia, you know, wherever there is like a yeah. Muslim majority place, basically. You know, and I get that most people when they hear is like, even in Turkey, even in Turkey, when you say Islamic, it's like Arab. You know, Saudi Arabia, turbans, rags, that sort of thinking. No freaking toilets with the days. It's just you know you kneel over and whatnot. Like yeah, like even like Turkey's a paradox in that regard. It's like you know Muslim majority country, and it's like yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, there is a distinction. And with that being said, it's like even before Islam, like yeah, there was a lot of things that one could tell to be familiar. Because in the end, you know, Islamic culture, you know, was founded amidst Arabic culture at first as a given, you know. It did evolve from there within, but then, you know, at the same time, you know, it, it is absolutely essential, you know, to see that, yeah, I mean, the, the Arabs didn't stop being Muslim. So, 
But that being said, it's like, oh yeah, like, it's, you know, Arabic history, especially even ancient Arabic history, you know, tribes, just tribes. Enough said, and it gets tense. It gets, it's like freaking Dune with the Fremen and whatnot, or, you know. The Pashtun of Afghanistan, it's like, you know, you have hard conditions, you're living in hard environments, you know, there's things to go by, enough said, you know, the Arabs were, if they're the nomads of the desert, you know, the Turks were basically, along with the Mongolians, you know, the nomads of the steppes, mm -hmm. and it's like, Needless to say, for the for the Turks, it was like, and I mean, for Eastern systems as whole, yes, there was, you know, a sense of chivalry, but it wasn't based on like a concept of, you know, there was gentlemanship, you know, but it wasn't like an exclusive concept that was separate from, you know, like one could talk about chivalry, but. It's like, you know, it was all based on like, you know, what a, what a, how a person should conduct themselves, you know, as a, as a good human being, uh, you know, according to the, the precedents and precepts of Islam. You know, you know, if, a, you know, and, you know, there were other subjects of other religions as well, you know, the ideal thing was like, you know, just be, just be a good, be a good servant, be a balanced you know, be in sir, be in sir, be an honorable service to your master and lord. You know, yeah, you could say it was, yeah, it was, it was exactly like that. But it was like, yeah, you were. It was expected. Everybody was equal in the sense that everybody was a servant. From you know, like that, from a general of Janus, from a you know, a commander of Janissaries to you know, like a trader, merchant, poor man. If you look at it, what everybody wore, it was basically the same gear, the same costume, you know. The only difference was, you know, if you, the quality basically showed, the quality of your clothing, not what you wore. Everybody more or less wore the same style, but the quality of what you wore basically denoted your social position in the hierarchy. You know, if you had fur, oh yeah, you were loaded, you were important. If not, you know, ordinary, you know. You have ordinary clothing, you have ordinary clothing. If it's decked out in like gorgeous silk, that's something. And with chivalry in mind, like like for instance, um, the whole concept of knighthood. You know, you do service, exceptional service, you're knighted, you're given land, and you know, it's like kings of barons and barons of knights. And even kings of knights, too, right? Beholden to him and him alone. Am I wrong about that? Because, see, you know, like, king, king, because kings have barons. Mm -hmm. And dukes and duchesses, you know, it's, it's further divided depending on how they would, but, you know, basically everybody has knights, right? Mm hmm. Or are knights basically at the bottom of that hierarchy? Knights are like... So they follow a code of chivalry, and it's like it's like a trade, right? It's like, as t uh, from the age of 12, they would become like... I think they started as like pages, right? And they learned some of the basic training, and then they be become squires, uh, right? And then their job was to assist them. They were like a, a caddy on the surf, right? They're not really a... Con squires aren't really a combat role. They may have a few weapons to defend themselves. But they're more just to help the knight, right? Because the knights were important in battle because they could break an entire line of defense. So there was different types of formations that were used. So one is pike, right? Which is two hands, like a big spear, right? Yeah, I know. There's, there's yeah. spear and shield, right? And the spear and shield was not good against uh, a cavalry, like even light cavalry with a spear could break through that easily just because of the momentum of all the horse, right? Pikes were a yeah. good um, answer to that. And so the knight's answer to the pike was the lance. So, 
or no, wait, no, no, no. I think... Was it first there were spears, then they used spears and shields against the spears, and then the lancers broke the shields, and then the, the pikes might have actually been the response to the lance, but... Yeah, it's interesting, and in, in, yeah, in European medieval warfare, it's always like this weapon beats that weapon, this weapon beats that weapon, right? Sword is good. Swords are good against pikes, but yeah. Funny. Ottomans never used pikes. No, no, they're not fans of pikes. They. Eh? No, it wasn't. It 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 didn't click. Because the way um, the way the Turks started out was, they basically had sec bonds, basically you know um, war bands, and you know your your warrior, your average Turkish warrior, consisted of um, you know he had light. The idea was he was lightly armored. He had armor, but not enough to impede his movements, because he was expected to be a fighter. You know, uh, to be um, all-around fighter, like melee combat, sword, shield, and bow, as well as bow. Mm -hmm. Spears did exist, wow. but pi but pike warfare wasn't really pike warfare. Never. We never really did it. Like Turks never did it. But if they had, like, say, you know, units you under can't. their it's command, too it's too hot. Capable. You can't. You can't have a guy decked out in all metal heavy armor, right? But in a suit of armor that weighs like two hundred pounds on a thousand pound horse rushing in to charge him, like in the desert seat, like the guy would he would boil alive, right? So it's yeah. like because lances never came into the game, right? In in Turkish medieval warfare, pikes didn't have to come. And then it was pike, and then there was gunpowder, and it turned like pike and shot, right? Sometimes the cavalry would have swords, right, and they would be the counter to the bayonets, right? Because then it's like they would shoot, they would shoot off the guns, right, and then the guy, the, the, the cavalry, cavalry, light cavalry with a sword, just comes and starts slicing people up, right? Yeah. It was like, well, it was like because the way, because uh, you know. Our, our our monarchy was basically a tribal aristocracy. You had this problem of um, conscription. You know, you need troops for campaigns and whatnot. Vassals just simply couldn't do because unlike, you know, European, like, your Turkish peasant wasn't just, you know, a peasant. He was also, he could be, he could be a nomad. He could be a land herder. He could even be like, a, you know, in command of his own tribe, basically. <laughs> so, given the fact that your average subject was a lip, was a bit more rowdy than you know your average, than your average Yo, subject. Got, hey Jack, come forward. The the rest of the whole gang. No, 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 no. Other way, other way. Jack, Jack, Jack. Over here, over here. Come here. here, here. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get to it. Let's four man and Jenny. And it, we're gonna, we're gonna cover the first generator. Okay, I, saw, I see one. I see one. I see one. Point out. <laughs> but um, it's like you know, imagine you're a king and you have barons, and these barons basically you know. Like, so, oh shit! Oh, Break away the wraith. The bust. Amen. Bust. Okay, me and Fang going on to the next journey down the line. Still on me. Don't leave me alone. Yeah, keep him in the chase as long as you can, man. You gotta keep... You gotta stay, uh... Keep his objectives going. Centralized state was much, much more apparent. The 
point where, where we basically, you know, conducted this program of creating a social class from scratch from conscripted indentured servants. So slavery with extra steps and benefits. Plus a career package. But, um, you know, slavery was a, was the whole sense of, like, you know, you're a, sl it, you're a slave in the sense of you're, you're a servant to the state. You're ser you're serve in the government, you're beholden to the emperor, your life hinges on his very will, so do your job, and if you do your job, you retire when you get old. Like, it was uptight, it wasn't so much about, you know, the whole concept of, yes, you know, there was the concept of, uh, you know, of the faith, that, you know, Sharia is what guides, basically, you know, Ottoman law. Even though Ottoman law is a thing, basically, you know. Sharia was, like, the top edge of the pyramid, and then, basically, all other aspects of Ottoman law was well, it, another, surrounded. I like a similar thing you think about in European history. Is there's all this codifying of laws, right? But there was this other yeah. document that could serve as, uh, you know, law for, you know, across different countries and put, you know, me principalities and stuff, and, and that was the Bible, right? Because all these people agreed that they believed in the same thing, right? So that if it wasn't... Like, the, the Bible obviously wasn't going to cover everything, right? But they could... You know, so even, like, Mosaic Law, right? So. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, because Judaism definitely. is le Most very legalistic, like too. So. On the whole thing, yeah. Like, Mosaic Law is definitely reflected in Ottoman Law as well, considering that, like, they also, Ottoman Law also had the considerations of not just Muslims, but, you know, other, of, of you know, it's, of its Jewish and Christian subjects as well. Hmm. Like, and they adapted, like, like, for instance, when the population of, Con uh, there was a time when the population, Catholic population of Istanbul had increased enough to the point where, you know, um, the Ottoman state was like, okay, well, we have to make a, we have to make a bishopric, we have to make a patriarchate for, um, you know, Catholic Christians within the empire, even though, it, that, you know, the only place that they were mostly was in Istanbul, like the majority of them having lived in Istanbul because they were usually merchants from, you know, Venice, Genoa, you know, the other Italian trading port cities city state such and such you know um, so compared to your night in Turkey which you had basically was um, like the closest thing was in terms of like representing the night the social economic ladder was the Sipahi and the Sipahi was basically um, same as the night the main difference was that, you know, the knight's role was hereditary, you know, it was granted, it was, um... Title. It was a title, um, associated with, you know, divinity, right? Hmm. Um, I don't believe the... Not divinity, but, Not you know, directly. You know the I king, mean. well, because, no, because knights were still had to be knighted by, like, a king or something, right? So... They, they were, yeah, I guess, by by chain, yes, it would still actually be divine. It's just not, it wouldn't seem as direct, right? Like, the divine right would be directly to the king. The king. Yeah. Yeah. So, in our system, um, after the divine right, <laughs> the divine right only ever belongs to the sovereign. <laughs> no sense or buts. The sovereign, the sultan, the emperor is the state, he is the government, he is, he, like, he embodies, he is we, he is the shadow of God upon her, as one of his main titles in the Turkish art. Khan of Khans, emperor of emperors, the holy, the Caesar of holy Rome. Like, to that end, like, like, Ottoman sultans, they did not cons they did not recognize the title of Holy Roman Emperor. This that's how they thought of themselves. Especially after, you know, they conquered Constantinople. 
but especially before they conquer Constantinople, but after they literally conquered like the entirety of Southeastern Europe around Istanbul beforehand. So yeah, that that the whole the whole everything was on the Sultan, you know. Um, and to that end, Sipahis were grant, you know, we'll call them knights, Turkish knights, Ottoman knights. Ottoman knights were granted basically a tamar, a fiefdom of land. Uh, tamar is like the average size, the small, the smallest unit of size is Ziamet. The biggest one is called Has. Um, if one was a Tamarlu, basically, it meant that his responsibilities would be that he's be he, he's in charge of basically making sure that the land is producing. Mm -hmm. It's producing that you know he's contributing his time and labor into you know like the you know into the directorship of these farms in the region. And his only, the only thing in return that he would have to supply for the state is basically at least one armed retainer or more, depending on his, uh, depending on like how much land he owns, like how big his tomorrow is. Tomorrow's like, um, and take into mind that there was no exact, it was semi-feudal. Like subjects were not like serfs, as in Russia, nor they were like, they were considered free subjects, through and through. So, that's how it worked. He basically would just get, he, his right would be to, you know, a proceeding, to a proceeding of, you know, what, whatever um, the Tamar was producing. And to that end, basically, depending on how many retainers he had trained and armored up, and they were known as Jebelu, um, the state would basically give him a stipend for every uh, retainer that he had trained and armored and geared up. And we actually called this, uh... Oh, wait, no. They, they actually give him these benefits by basically, um, lessening his expenses. They take it off, off of his expenses for armor and such. And this was known as, like, the, uh, the sword tax benefit. Called the sword tax, basically. Um, a, 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 a Sipahi son, though his dad could not, technically, by all, like, officially, by all legality, could not inherit his father's position. Even if he was groomed, it would be like, yeah, he would still have to. So it's like, it's exactly what you said. But like, we're both leaning away from the center, but pretty much. It's like, yeah, Spahi's son is like, oh, of course he's gonna be, you know, like, I mean, why wouldn't he, you know? Provided that his father is keeping up his responsibilities. Because one of the things about holding a Tamar and being a Spahi was that you had to end, you had to embark on campaign. If you didn't, you know, service, if you didn't enter campaign service within seven years, um, you were kicked out of your kingdom. And you basically had to start over and you had to prove yourself. Responsibility. Yeah. And that was like, you know, good luck. But, um, that's how basically fiefdoms Work because beforehand it was yeah it was basically principalities mainly very much so and vassal kingdoms but in Anatolia it was like like the Ottomans had a dual aristocracy there was the imperial family but then you know they had to deal with their vassals in Europe which were you know for the most part European and at the same time they had to deal with you know the Turkic aristocracy which was very much you know semi-nomadic, tribal, to the nth degree, and it was like, it was basically Europe, you know. Blood marriages and, you know, arguments between relatives. So what the Ottomans did was they literally, they, they cheat-coded their way. Mm -hmm. Most uh, Darwinious, Darwiniously, they were basically like, you know what? Fuck that shit. We gonna... are gonna be, we, we, we're gonna flex, you're gonna pee? 
Yeah, I'm gonna go pee quick. And by, by the way, do you mind if I if I upload all the stage and just give me my episode? The yeah, iGamer Play Survivor Story Time with Jack special. <laughs> oh jeez, I'm right. I'm. Dude, this is great. This was great. This is this is content. Uh, this is real fucking content. This is what I need. Any more than just gameplay. Fair Wait. enough. Yeah. But I'm liking it. You're keeping it spicy, man. You're keeping it interesting. History slash story time with Jack. So, uh, yeah, you Honest can. Spike. Yeah, it, it captures all my audio. So anything you say, if you you can even keep going story. If you just want to like get right into it, man. Like, don't even sure. make. I I won't even make you hold your breath. You just go. Like the game oh doesn't matter. God. Don't worry about the call -ups. Like the, the story time is king. Oh, that is the sovereign. That is the divine right. God dang. Uh, the divine right. The divine right was for Europe. It was what one would call in the East. I don't know. Call it the Sultan's Justice. There we go. Perfect. Encapsulate it. I will go with the Ottomans basically because they were the last and then the longest lived and you know the most recent one could add and they were like you know at the center of a lot of things I mean in terms of Middle Eastern Empire Middle Eastern kingdoms and empires I mean we could talk about the Persians you know going back to the ancient era you know it was Zoroastrianism and a whole bunch of dynasties long lived and powerful and all that fucking armor just just strips of hoop metal you know makes them look like i don't know plated up roman armadillos or something but yeah you know you you see a lot of the armors you see a lot of the techniques that were used like in forging weapons and armors and basically pottery even architecture and you're looking across you know the in regions of the world you know like for example the Mediterranean and you're looking at it through all these different periods of time and history and it's just like you know history is is one big fat and thick continuum whether one just gets you know freaking mind fucked by it or not you know it might it might even give you a headache I'm not gonna lie I mean why wouldn't it it's it's so much to take in especially and with the Ottomans, I mean, they're a good example because they were like, they were at the, I mean, one hand, they dealt with European empires as well as, you know, West, Western Asian empires or Middle Eastern, if you want to go that way. But, um, you know, what was considered a divine right of kings for us, for the, you know, for, for people in the East, or I, get, I reckon for, you know, subjects of the Ottoman Empire was the Sultan's justice. You know, his justice set the world in order. And, you know, with being the caliph, quote, unquote, you know, with uh, basically uh, an event that culminated with the Ottomans becoming, you know, the Ottoman sultans becoming the caliphs of the Islamic world and therefore, you know, having more of a forefront, more direct rule over, um, over this culture. You know, it was like, you have the sultan, he's the caliph, He's the Khan of Khans. He is the Caesar of Holy Rome. Of the cities of Rome and Constantinople, you know, that's why. Fuck the Holy Roman Empire, you know. Who are they? The king in Austria. That's that's who they were. That That's how, literally, these guys recognized them as. I mean, we even started a war with Austria over, you know... The Francis II, I... Wait, no. Something. And the Holy League. Oh. Yeah, it was basically like, you know, uh, yeah, we're gonna make it, we're gonna have a peace treaty and it's between the Ottoman Sultan and the Holy Roman Emperor and then, you know, Sultan Ahmed I who made this pimpin' ass mosque, one of the most gorgeous pieces of architecture, you know, one could ever see. Um, he flips, he's like, you know, the fuck is he? Who the fuck are you? You know, I mean... You know, at least, well, in his view, it was like, at least this guy's dad and granddad had the common courtesy to dot, 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 and such and such. 
Yeah. But, you know, this time around, it's like, yeah, we, we're the Holy Roman Empire. We're down with that. Get used to it. And this was like, really? You're neither holy, you're neither Roman. And, you know, as far as an empire goes, it's like, I mean, even Charles V, he, he, he left. He retired at the age of like 60 something. This guy abdicated from two thrones. The, the Spanish throne and the Holy Roman throne, basically the Austrian throne. It was like he, he ran two empires at the same time. And it was like, God damn. All because he was a Habsburg. And it's like, you know, the albums were like, well, la di da. And, and I mean, to be fair. Big shoes they, to fail, they, man. <laughs> they, they were 80 miles away. The Ottomans were 80 miles away from Rome, but, you know. As as big projects, as with big projects like this, it's like you know, if the director quits, then you're gonna have like the fucking shitty Justice League cut, which is exactly what happened when Mehmed II died on his expedition to Italy a few ye a couple of years after he had conquered Constantinople. He was hell bent. He was like, I'm gonna be the fucking Ottoman Alexander, baby. I'm gonna take Constantinople and I'm gonna take Rome and I'm gonna. I'm gonna do to Rome what I did to Constantinople, which is like, you know, three days of pillaging, and then nobody touches anything. Everything is restored, people are forcibly resettled in the gorgeous, glorious city of their lives, artisans, traders, and whatnot. And basically, the Ottomans would have treated the Pope as they would have the Archbishop of Istanbul. Basically, as representative and head of all, in the Pope's case, of all um, Catholic Christians. But then, you know, that, that would have been, that would have been real interesting to see. But I digress. I mean, the Ottomans still did it afterwards, like many years later. It was like, you have a, you have a sizable Catholic population, you might as well start up an office. Like a millet. That's, what, that's how we classified it basically so it was like um you know jews had their own jews had their own halakhic law to go by christians and it got this got interesting because for the, for for the ottomans it was like you know christians are christians jews are jews. they classified people based on religion but and they didn't even bother to go down to the sects so for the ottomans it was like okay all christians are beholden you know to do uh yeah. To the responsibility and uh, leadership of the Archbishop of Istanbul. However, there is Orthodox Christians, but not all Orthodox Christians are, you know, one. You know what I'm talking about. You know, mm. you have Armenian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and you know, they're Orthodox, but in the end. It reflects the fact that Christianity really popped up in a lot of different places, mm -hmm. even before it popped up in Europe. Mm -hmm. Like Armenia and Georgia, the first two kingdoms to accept Christianity in the world, like the first two states. And they're like east of Turkey and south of Russia. The first two kingdoms, and this was back when, you know, people were, it was just proselytizing, spreading across you know, the Byzantine world and such and such. And then, you know, it it took hold eventually, you know. You know, you have... And I mean, this was back in the days of, like, when Rome was, you know... They, it wasn't the old ancient Roman Empire anymore, but it, it was still pagan. Like, there was a time. Mm. And it was like, yeah, like, you know, there were places that were Christian even before the Romans turned Christian. And this reflects that, like, you know, Christianity really spread. You know, there's Syriac Christianity, Assyrian Orthodox, the Assyrian Orthodox Church, the Syriac Orthodox Church, you know, like you have Christians whose ancestors were um, some of the first Christians. And they still prostrate as in the old days, like as in kneeling, you know, kneeling, like kneeling to the ground. You know, like, and to that end, you know, there was a second class citizen 
Turkish associated with it. It was like, you know, what what does this mean? It entails that basically Turkish Muslims are the dominant social group, you know, given that they're they're ruling everything and whatnot. But it was basically like the Mughals and what they did in India. Because the Mughals themselves were, were Turks. They were Turk it was a Turko Mongol dynasty, Muslim, invading India, and India is literally like all, it's this place of principalities, all these freaking princes and kings and rajas and maharajas and shit like that, you know. Most Hindus, some others different and such and such. So what did the Mughals do? Mughal being like the Hindu, the Hindi word, maybe not Hindi, I don't, uh, again, I'm being inaccurate because I'm also being, uh, that's a word that like kind of like describes most of, like the the people. Who, yeah, I don't want to say like ethnically Mughal Hindu, Mughal. but basically yeah. Right? Mughal means Mongol, but hmm. I, I forget was it an Urdu or I'm I'm, I'm guessing it was Urdu. I'm I'm saying that with a grain of salt. Uh, one second, my dad's home. Protection game, oh shit. He's still on me! Look! Stop creeping on me! Uh, this guy oh won't god, stop crawling. Oh my god, he's just trying to that. Oh. Yeah. But um sorry, my dad was just letting me know there was rain and he's like if he wanted if I wanted him to pick me up later. That's what I told him. Oh, I don't mind dying on the name of good convos. But um what was I going on about? But yeah, the Mughal the Mughals, a you know, meaning Mongol basically because uh, you know. But yeah, they're Muslim. But even they had the even they figured out a system of how to basically, you know support this pluralism within the society, economically and socially. And it was all social economic. So, we're, we're Hindus... Even though... Like, um... So were Hindus like, even, uh, like... Were they even dominant in India, like, before the British came, or no? Okay, okay. The Mughals ruled over it. Uh, the Mughals ruled over India for, I think, its last 200 years. Again, grain of salt. Yeah. Um... But again, they were a Muslim, Turco Mongol minority amongst a Hindu majority, basically, in India. Yeah. And to accommodate this, I mean, they, they more or less did this, they took the same route that the Ottomans did, tax. What the Ottomans did was, um, they basically said, here's a millet system, everybody's organized according to their own law. And Ottoman law supports this. Ottoman law supports the fact that, you know, there is halakhic law and that, you know, that this law is there for Jews to follow. There is canon law, or, or at least, you know, the, the orthodox interpretation of canon law. And this is represented by the Archbishop of Constantinople, and he's there to serve it, you know, for Christians. But of course, you know, the side effect of this pluralism being that, you know, it, again, the dominant group being Turks, it ended up being that, uh, you know, in the end, Sharia ended up being like the superior for the problem, if you know what I'm saying, if, if that makes sense to you. Because technically all Turkish, all Turks were Muslims, right? So the court that they would go through is through the Sharia. It's through Sharia courts, basically. The Sharia law would be applied. Like, for instance, like, I stole something. Okay, uh, the defendant wants my hand cut off. What did I steal? A cookie. Okay, how much was the cookie? Uh, 13... Sh we'll go with shekels. Or akhja. We call it akhja, but we can do shekels. 
Okay, we'll say uh, seven shekels. It says, and again, Sharia is also beholden upon the interpretation of the ju of the uh, of the jurist, you know, presiding, doing the proceedings, right? But again, it's like you know, Sharia basically says something along the lines of, um, you know. Let the let the shoe fit the foot, you know, let the punishment fit the crime. So, okay, the idea is, all right, so depending on the punishment, you know, you don't want to go too far. So, to that end, it's like, okay, I stole a cookie for, se it, was a se it was worth seven shekels, this cookie that I stole. The guy wants my hand cut off. I'm a real young lad. I'm like 12 years old. And the judge, you know, being a real, being a human being, he's gonna be like, really? Well, I mean, the law, of course, and of course, the law states that Ottoman law states that you have to have stolen at least a certain, like this much amount of shekels worth of property yeah. before meeting the criteria for a punishment. Ottoman law said, Ottoman law states that, and you know. Sharia supports this, given that Ottoman law is considered of Sharia. It kind of molded, it, it, it evolved around it basically, but Ottoman law itself was con canonical law, meant for basically, you know, bridging all the, all these, you know, religious laws of the empire basically into one coherent, you know, law for all subjects, more or less. But again, it wasn't perfect. But, um, it worked. It ended up being that, um, you know, the Ottomans were like, Hey, listen, are you a Jew? Are you a Christian? Okay. Pay the tax and we're good. Done and done. Although it was like, you know, one could say that, you know, this was, uh, you know, it was, it was discriminatory. It was, you know, it was... It was basically putting him into a second-class situation because given the fact that, you know, being a Jew and Muslim back in, you know, Renaissance era Ottoman Empire was like, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't have weapons on you. You couldn't have a horse. You couldn't, and depending on the will of, depending on the will of certain sultans, it was like, you know, one or two here could have been real like assholes and be like, okay, yeah, all Jews have to wear like this symbol and whatnot. You know, that happened once or twice, but again, it was like, this is a system where, you know, your government, your state, your constitution, your laws, you know, the be all end all is the salt is in the figure of the sultan, basically. So, you know, good sultans, good sultans like Suleiman, they were like, they made everything into a, like a well bureaucratically oiled machine that all every like everything is in harmony with one another, that subjects are in harmony with one another, you know, given the fact that, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of, you know, peoples to that end um on the other hand you have you know you have the mughals they did the same thing too the way they went about it was given that they were in the minority right because india is big it's a subcontinent of thousands of kingdoms of states principalities you know and given that each and every single one of them have their own traditions, their own code, their own canon, their own such and such, you know? Like, basically, it's practically Europe, right? But how do these guys do it? Tax. You just institute a well-oiled tax system. You have these tax collectors called Zamindars. And it's funny, too, because it's... It's the same thing, like the word zam in Turkish means a uh, tax or levy or yeah, uh, zam, zamindar, zamindar, you know, they would, zamindar is basically, they would go from, you know, from town to town and basically, you know, they had, they had a list, they had criteria to meet and they basically met it, you know, it was just, that's the way we went about, you know, just securing land, tax revenue, um, you know, bureaucratic functions and warfare. Because given that, you know, the taxes, because given that, you know, like, um, 
you know, there were systems in place basically to keep things in harmony. Now, this is where the Tamar Laspahi, where the Ottoman Knights came in. Given that these guys worked the land, they worked the people working the land, they were the provincial aristocracy. They were basically the inheritors and the successors of the Turkish tribal nobility. Because these guys were, you know, they were unruly. They were more or less, you know, they were families basically. And then the Sultan basically said, you guys are going to run the provinces. You guys are going to run my army. You guys are going to run the land and, you know, gather up re um, retainers, armed men at arms, tipahis. Or as one would use the word Sipahiyan, you know, if you want to go Persian about it. You know, armored and chainmail, plus plates that were on top of the chainmail because, you know, you wanted mobility. They, we were basically like medium knights compared to, you know, uh, European knights in plate mail armor. Because the idea still was that even in that armored state, you would still be able to shoot a bow. You would still be mobile. Turkish horses were not as big as European horses, they were actually smaller, given that, you know, horses from Central Asia and the steppes, they were, you know, they were more used to cold, you know, just the cold and, you know, long treks and endurance. To that end, because of, uh, you know, a little bit of breeding with Arabians as well, it, it helped out being that, you know, um, Ottoman horses were smaller, but they were more nimble, and they could carry a... a just a little bit more which helped because the, uh, the knights were themselves light so they provided the backbone of the army but then the rest of the army basically was uh, you know you had your vassals you had your specialized conscripts and troops and then you had the conscripts you know the janissary as, um, as exemplified by the janissaries and then you had the creme de la creme as exemplified by the household cavalry basically, you know, Janissaries on horseback. You just build a slave uh, bureaucracy from scratch, and you relegate your, you know, your noblemen to the provincial age. Such is the price of centralization, my guy. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, it was like, well, you know, the divine right now was the divine right of kings is the sultan's justice it's one guy that's that's how it went like i look at europe and i look at the ottomans in the same time and it was like oh shit they did the whole modern thing before we even went postmodern with it because, you know, like the whole idea of like giving salaries to your men and whatnot. Mm. Again, like this is not the first time the Romans did it. The Romans fucking figured that shit out. But even the Romans were, you know, they even they experienced the fact that, you know, that shit has a societal effect. I mean, the Romans, by basically removing the property classification, the property and wealth uh, regulations for people, in the army that basically meant that every single person could join the religions it meant that every poor per every person that had no land no money they were homeless they could join the army before those reforms they couldn't because they weren't considered as such it, it was that's how it went and for the turks it was like take the spartan agogi and then turn it into a yeah turn it into a tribute Turn it into, uh... Do what the Halo Spartans did, basically. Enough said. You prevent correct insurrection. You assimilate. As well as integrate, because given the fact that, you know... Not all would forget where they were from and such and whatnot. But it was like, even still... Even still, it was like... The whole practice of basically taking in kids that met specification that met qualifications to bring them back to you know be assimilated and to be assimilated into Turkish society to be converted into Islam and then from there to you know be trained into Janissaries or to be sent into the inner palace school within the palace itself 
to become full, you know, full-fledged inner youth. The inner youth were basically, these were the guys that became grand viziers, artisans, constructors, engineers, palace officials, bodyguards, what have you, or even part of, you know, the elite household cavalry, the house or the household infantry. Your outer youth basically became Janissaries, but you know, it wasn't like they weren't separate. It was just two routes of advancement based on the proclivities of the kid. Kids would be, you know, the kids would basically be brought to Istanbul and then they were given examinations basically. And depending on their performance, you know, they were either made Janissaries or, you know, if they had a bit of something more, you know, more of a twinkle to their eye and to their way of thinking, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to give them a bit more training. It's like, you know, the difference between academic and applied for us high schoolers, basically. But they didn't tell you. Apl if you were applied, yeah, you were a Janissary. Red uniform and the white cap. But that did not, pr but that doesn't mean that, you know, Janissaries were excluded from, you know, entering into palace service and whatnot. It was just, you know, there was a whole system to it, basically. Uh. But advancement was not blocked at oh. all to anyone, technically. <laughs> Are you, there's, a, there's a guy in the, Oh, yeah, you should check out the, uh, the Twitch chat, yo. Yeah. The, uh, this guy was trying to... I haven't checked in a while. He's <laughs> like, hi, we have boob. Hi, bestie. What are you listening to? Also, my butt hurts from chair. Drop the link. What are you listening to? Unless this is you talking. I'm a weeaboo. Who the fuck are you? Are you a history major? Because I'm not. Ha ha ha. Hey, talk. Talk. What? I'm gonna. I said sorry, man. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Am I a weeaboo? <laughs> podcast. I'm saving. Man, Thing this gonna post on a YT as uh no. yeah. time with Uncle Jack. <laughs> the divine right of the And man. I scooped up into the followed by I didn't see the alert box. I mean, or maybe I could have been in the bathroom on. too when it happened. It's also a possibility. Three followers. Three. Yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. But yeah, Jack. Jack knows more history than most history majors, I would say. I don't want to know too too much. You started out. Did you start it out as a history major? Then you switched to. Uh, Drama for a bit, right? I then switched to, uh, to drama for next year, but then, man, it was <laughs> God. I was, I don't know. I was, I was just distraught over a lot of things. So it was like second year, um, I transfer over to drama. Yeah. Dramatic arts. But I find out that I haven't been going to a class. Yeah. By the time I find out, for three months. Because the way they code, the way they color coded my schedule was very much off, and yeah. I did not realize this until it was brought to my attention, mm. and that just made me kind of go like, you know what, I'm done, I'm I'm done here, Brock. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tap out. Yeah, there was, was there like an overlap in your schedule? Did you have like two classes at the same time? So your schedule just looked like you didn't even have it? Yeah. Yeah. It looked and that was just like... You know when you're like, you're doing good, but then you realize, oh, you've been fucking up this entire time, and it's like, oh my god. Yeah, it, it put me on kind of a... I was like, ah... Uh, I, I felt so embarrassed. But yeah, it was like, you know, while there was, you know, feudalism and being noble and knowing your place below, like we were just, we were really, like, taking it up a notch. It was just like, ah, oh, fuck, just, if 
Divine Bride of Kings. Plural. Plural. There can be only one. You know, that whole blood sprinkling. How's some hex causing blindness? Or no, oblivious. Yeah, you know. That's it. Come on, sweet thing, man. Yeah, he must be going. Like... Getting it? Yeah, she's on me. Oh. Uh. Oh, what happened to your hands? You have pretty. Dang. Your hands. That's why I don't stretch him. Just crack the knuckles. I beg you. A lot of things that like you know people associate ottomans with it was like that was more like that was more of a caliphate type of deal I hear caliphates did that more so the exceptions were basically if you notice any air any caliphate that had real close contact with christians the western example the for a bit. yeah the western example i could quote is you know Al Andalus, you know, Andalusia, the, the, Islam, the, the Islamic Kingdom of Cordoba, basically the Muslims in Spain and Portugal at the mm. time. Um, and the, you know, the other example is the Ottomans, given that, you know, they were both, they, they had entered into Anatolia, you know, as the Muslims. And Anatolia being full of all these, you know, different peoples, most of them practicing Christianity, it was like there was a synthesis that was bound to have occurred because the Turks themselves were, you know, they were shamanists, tangriists, nomads, you know, it's like with a nomadic lifestyle, one couldn't afford to, you know, really be dogmatic in one's beliefs, you know, adaptation is belief, you know, seeing just different ways. Like expressing different types of whatnot. Like I mean, there's there's people in Turkey. They're not Christians, but you know they're Muslims, and they go to old monasteries as veneration. It's a thing. Because veneration, you know, regardless of whether one was you know this religion or that, it was like or this per this people or that people. Veneration was a Fucking break, tr fucking tradition, you know, within that region at the time, and given their, you know, history of, you know, like, you know, fighting and then diplomacy and then fighting and diplomacy, and fighting and diplomacy, and then finally, you know, eventual, you know, fight to the end, diplomacy, I mean, fight to the end with the Byzantines. It's like, you know, they interacted. It was like 150 years of interaction with Byzantines, Serbians, Bulgarians, Hungarians. Bosnians and you know very much like the first 200 years of like the Ottoman Empire was basically just a history of what is Turkey you know the Middle East and southeastern Europe as a whole basically the first 200 years you know it was like yeah something like what yeah had the Serbians in the early 1400s being like a huge power player as a kingdom in their right. They were getting big. 
and the Bulgarians. And one, and one point they were big too. And the Bosnians, you know, fighting and resisting, as well as resisting Turkish invasion. You know, everybody did. And then it became to be that, you know, vassal ship was better. You know, making treaties was a bit better because, you know, fuck the Central Europeans and the papish, popish designs and whatnot and such and such. And, you know, as far as Southeastern Europe was concerned, it was like, let me give an example. The early 1400s, Hungary was like right fucking there, right at the north of the Balkans, right? Hungary. I'm talking like... Hungary, the Black Army of Hungary, Mathis Corvinius, Hungary, you know, like, these guys who were, who had just been nomads, and now they were being, you know, the equal of any other European kingdom. And by the golly man, they were beefy. They had a lot of muscle back in those days, let me tell you. And to that end, it was the, you know, it was mainly the Hungarians being like, Yo, Europe, you know, like, freaking, you want a crusade? Here it is. Here's a perfectly good reason right now why there should be a crusade, you know. They're right there. We don't even have to go to Jerusalem. They're right there. They're freaking going at it. They are active and they are headed our way. They are about to fuck our shit up. And, oh, boy, this is great. You know. We have many others like Mass Corvinius, Vlad the Third of Dracula, Wallachia, um, Transylvania. Transylvania is interesting. Transylvania is in Romania, but it culturally and demographically is pretty much um, Hungarian. So that's a bit of a that's a bit of a thing between Hungary and Romania, actually. Yeah, the more I know about the Balkans, the more I'm just like. Yeah. Why can't, why shouldn't I feel, uh, regret? I mean, I read about the Balkans, and all I do is just look over at my, you know, the, the faded spirits of my fez-wearing ancestors, and just being like, you fucking idiots! You had one job! You had one fucking job! But, you know, it took them, like, almost 200 50 years to figure out like they were fucked that they were fucking up so you know I'm not gonna I won't blame them. ow ow you know just like that slap in the face yes again there's like stories within stories when it comes to all parts of the world you know or to be Europe, Western Asia, East Asia, you know, the Far East of Asia, and such and such. Yeah, goddamn right. I mean, man, we had units. That still blows my mind. I'm going for we them. We had units. And they weren't even Asian. The meta I'm gonna go for right now is gonna be uh, let the killer find the hatch first and just pop it. Okay, right. But yeah, fam, when was the last time Europe had Unix? Huh? Unix? Yeah. You mean like monks? Priests? Good. I mean, like, guys like Varys from Game of Thrones, where they're actually in positions of, like... So, like, priests, monks, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say priests or monks. Uh. And what about a, uh, say... Cardinal, well, people higher up in... In the, uh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get, I get, I get yeah, those are kind of the lower rings, but, but, priests would be educated people, right? And they would be able to do something that a lot of other people in the time couldn't do, and that's read, right? And just being literate, right, made them, I think, kind of a legalistic of the word, right? Thanks, guys. 
gods, right? They can be used as some kind of all-purpose judge, right? The, the thing about, like, what the church did is, like, they were almost like, <laughs> they were like the jack of all trades, right? They did ceremonies for weddings, they did funerals, they did, you know, they did had schools, they had hospitals, right? They still have these things today, right? And they, I don't know, there's some kind of community support system, people giving donations, and then the church kind of returns that through services, I guess. So... For us, eunuchs were, they were typically imported from outside of the domains because yeah. Islam forbid, Islam forbids, um, they forbids castration. Mm -hmm. So what they would do was they would import eunuchs from outside. So they were, they were already eunuchs, basically. Yeah. They were made eunuchs beforehand. Um, and a fair share of male, like in, 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 in Ottoman, uh, like a fair share of, of the count of male slaves, you know, in, in, not, in the Ottoman Empire were imported as units. And there was two categories, actually. Um, you had black eunuchs and white eunuchs. And um, the whole idea of the eunuchs was that, well, you had the palace, and you basically had what you called the, the court. You know, you guys call it the court. We call it the harem. And um, yes, it was the sultan, his family, and a bunch of people. Yes, there was a lot of ladies. No, it was not that fucking exciting. Yes, it was that fucking soul-crushing and depressing. Basically, the whole idea was, you know, it was like the private quarters of the Sultan. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, you had the wives, you know, like the four legal wives. You had the servants, basically both female slaves and male eunuchs. Female relatives and the concubines, like the Sultan's concubines. Mm -hmm. And concubine it was seen as like, you know, it's like you have a concubine, She's your wife without being your wife. Because there was also, you know, there was a difference between concubinage and odalisks. Odalisks were like, they were exclusively for pleasure. A concubine was like, you know, it was an extension of marriage mm -hmm. to that end. The, the institution ba it basically, um, it, this, this occupied the, the seraglio. That's what the Italians called it. We called it the harem. It was basically the secluded portion of the household, the secluded portion of the palace, which I have visited some time ago, actually. Um, the institution played the social, fu it, it played an important social function. It was like, um, the idea was that there was a time where, you know, the Sultan was active and, um, the first while there was marriages between kingdoms basically you know you had sultans marrying byzantine princesses serbian princesses croatian bosnian turkic what have you basically but then you know as his role became sedentary in the palace you know back then you had family members dispersed between provincial capitals but then they were eventually relieved of their public duties and you know they were gathered in the in the capital basically you know, it was basically, um, in one sense, a, uh, a breeding facility. Because the more princes there were, the more opportunities there was. And again, there was a policy of fratricide. Every time a sultan came to power, whatever, any other male relative that was not of his own line, dead. And, um... Basically, uh, well, you know, it was an ultimate symbol of power and to that end they had eunuchs basically guarding and you know Looking over the harem basically, you know um, Being the administrators so and like I said before you had black and white eunuchs um, So back then what was said was that Back then all eunuchs were white eunuchs basically mm -hmm. When it came to you know importing human beings and yes slavery um Ottoman slavery was like 
it wasn't really so big upon the whole concept of chattel slavery, given that Islam had his Islam had its dealings with that. Like, so what you know, makes, wait, wait, just to be clear, so what, what makes chattel slavery chattel, chattel slavery chattel slavery? Um, the fact that, you know, as a human being, you are property. Okay. Like, you're complete and utter property. No ifs, ands, or buts. You have no difference between your own person and the chair, and the very chair that you sit on. <laughs> that, for me, is chattel slavery. Your livestock. And, um... And treated as such. So know? what, is this more like indentured servitude? Um, given that is given that Islam was stringent upon the whole idea of slavery, you know, being put to a situation of indentured servitude, yes. Back in the day, back in Muhammad's time, he had blessings be upon him and such, um, slavery was, you know, it was booming in the Ar Arabian Peninsula. And very much so to the point of where, you know, it was like, there was no limit on how many wives a man could marry back in those days, basically. And when Islam came, a lot of the things that we see in Islam and, you know, associate with, you know, oh, this 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 is Arabic culture, you know, what, what not. Islam actually was like a big moderating influence on it. Islam came up with the idea of like, you know, hey, have four instead of a whole bunch, have four wives. Why? Because even though we're all used to the idea of multiple wives, at least, you know, a, lo a fixed and low number will make you, you know, be in line with your responsibilities and duties and considerations a bit more, you know. You have four wives, four people to look after. And, you know, in Islam, you know, it's like, if a man can't take care of his four wives, then, you know, he's... He has no business as such, you know, along the, along the lines of that. Coming to slavery, Islam introduced basically, you know, like codes on slavery, like legalistic opinions on slavery, which was like, you know, a slave should be treated as such in such a manner as a human being, because a slave is a human being, you know. While is Islam took like a neighbor have Lincoln approach, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like oh, you know, slavery is, you know, it doesn't mean, yeah, slavery is not really ideal. But as an approach to mitigate it, what it says is, hey, listen, we're already going with the fact of like, you know, we're, you're, you know, you're holding a person to your own will, against their will. So with that in mind, Let's go about it a, uh, you know, a, a legalistic and civil way, which was like, oh, now there's laws. There, you know, Islam, there are Islamic laws on slavery, which one of them being like, uh, listen, he's not, he's not a slave in the sense of like, oh, you know, just a complete other slave. He's an indentured, sir, like being a slave in Islamic society was like, your master had to legally write up a contract legally if one was to be owned it had to be drafted up it had to be signed and administered in the presence of a judge you know and well, to that end, even in chateau slavery was that was still though they had deeds yeah. to slaves yeah. right they had to have legal these were expensive yeah. things the slave was not something that was cheap right most people could not afford it's not like yeah. everyone could just afford a slave right Exactly. So that's why only 3% of, you know, the entire slave of of slavery within the Ottoman Empire was like 3 to 5, we'll go with 5 to 7%. 5 to 7% of it was chattel slavery and in the sense of, you know, slaves were used for basically, you know, grueling and one should say, you know, um inhuman labors tasks. of malpractice. Yeah. yeah. Inhuman tasks, labors of malpractice, sexual slavery, what have you. You know, the whole concept of, I mean, the whole word white slavery came up because, you know, people were getting, people were getting really fed up with, you know, Ottoman Corsairs raiding ships and enslaving, you know, just taking passengers into the trade. 
the slave trade basically while they were on their way to Jerusalem from Europe and whatnot. It was a thing. Yeah. That it was. And, you know, at the same time, you know, conducting... Well, it was like the Crimean Tatars would like raid across the steppes, Orthodox villages and such and such, and, you know, just basically sell people into servitude. And then the Ottomans... They just took the system and they turned it in. The harem was like a female agogi, basically. The whole idea was, you know, just like Dev Shirme. I mean, just like the male youth, you know, from the markets or from this and there and whatnot. You basically look out for these ladies that were healthy, intelligent, strong. Like, they were educated in the same way that the Janissaries and, you know, the inner palace youth were trained as, except that, you know, being, you know, females, they weren't given that emphasis on physical education. Nevertheless, you know, it was like, you know, sciences, knowledge, poetry, arts. You know, they were given like a university level education. You know, just all that. You know, it wasn't like. It wasn't so much nobility, it was all about just bureaucracy. Fuck, he's on me. Fuck, he's on me. He's right on me. Thank you, Michael, for interrupting my fucking history lesson. Anyways, um... The idea was, you know, you pick out, you pick out these ma ladies in waiting, basically. These, these maids that worked in the palace. You know how, like, Queen Elizabeth had her lady, ladies in waiting, basically? Mm -hmm. You know? Escorts. Most of the women in the harem were that. Right? Ladies in waiting. I was confused by that. Is that is that, that what ladies in waiting are? Well, no, you know, no. Lady is lady is like a lordship Listen, title. These are that's that's like what? almost like a miniature princess. My right? God, a lady in waiting meant that she was in waiting to be married. Off. Oh. Yeah. Either to a nobleman or to somebody important in Yeah, force. but she's not yeah, not a she's, she's not a whore, know. right? Like, you know. No, it's not a whore. Are you kidding me? Look, listen. She, okay, Queen Elizabeth the first. She has maidens in her courts. Yes. Ma 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 you know, ladies that accompany her, maiden ladies that she teaches, basically. You know, in terms of education and courtship and whatnot. The idea is that they would be trained you know in so, in this way and basically with time you know in in the court you know they would end up meeting other noblemen perhaps close to the queen you know to england and whatnot and basically you know <coughs> it's like for the queen she's not having daughters but you know they're being part of the nobility basically you know, these ladies in waiting, these maids are going to be, you know, a nobleman's wife, a baron's wife, basically. Maybe even a future prince's wife, you know, some mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing. These ladies were usually from, you know, upper crust families, from my, from, you know, whatever major or minor noble families. The idea was they were at court to learn. The only differences between, you know, the European court and the Ottoman court was that um, if you were not part of the Turkish nobility, it meant only one thing. If you were a part of the empire, if you were part of the court, and you were not a part of the Turkish nobility, it meant one thing. They brought you there. You are a kapakulu. You are a servant of the port. The door, basically, because that's what the Italians called. Um, the center of government for the audience, the sublime port. Because that's what we called our, uh, that's what we called uh, the Ottoman Empire. Devleti Aliye Osmani, the sublime Ottoman state. We never called it an empire. But to that end, um, yeah, the difference was, yeah, these ladies in waiting, I mean, actually, not so much of a difference. It was. Fuck, it was added in basically. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have made that mistake. Besides, you know, besides the phenomenon of indentured servitude existing through Dev Shirme, basically, you know, through, you know, um, 
bringing over young boys and girls and then basically, you know, assimilating them and then raising them up within the Imperial, the Imperial State's own education system, basically. You know, besides that, there were also, you know, like, say, daughters of vassals. You know, daughters of other kings who basically, you know, as an o as a peace overture, basically practically sent their daughters or sons over as hostages, you know, to um, the Empire. It wasn't all that... It's di there are different nuances, but ultimately it wasn't that altogether different from, you know, what, what Europe's been doing. Like, there were interactions and such and such. I mean, Dracula... Like Dracula, right? Mm. His dad was Vlad the Second, Dracula. Now he fought for Wallachia, but then he figured that he needed the help of the Ottomans to keep Wallachia, you know, independent of the Hungarians, which were being a real power player back in those days. So to that end, you know, Vlad understood that he had to. He had to basically, you know, send um, send two sons to Istanbul as political hostages. <laughs> and for the Ottomans, that basically meant, okay, yeah, they're Devshirmen. We're gonna basically integrate them, you know, by way of assimilating them. Um, Dracula's younger brother, Radu Chelfrumos, who was also known as Radu the Handsome. Mm -hmm. Um, he f he got along well. He fit along well. He actually became a goddamn pasha in the Ottoman army. He became the commander of Janissaries, you know, part of the Sultan's own cavalry and whatnot. Mm. And you know, what guys are. Dracula, on the other hand, he was not as um, cooperative. He certainly didn't like his captors, and he didn't get as much cool treatments as he did, you know, as he did, uh, as uh, his brother did. So, and like another example was, another example like Dracula was uh, George Skanderbeg, um, whose crest of, whose family coat of arms is basically the flag of modern day Albania, the, uh, the black headed eagle on the bread background. Yeah, and this guy was, uh, he was a member of the Scanderbe family, uh, of the Castriati family, a uh, family of great uh, noblemen. They were a big, they were a big family in Albania. And basically, this kid became a Devshirman. This kid, this, the son of a nobleman, of one of the pro most prominent Albanian noblemen in the, in the country, became a Janissary. And through his training and knowledge, he basically turned everything upside down on the Ottomans' heads and basically started a guerrilla war um, on the Ottomans in Albania for like 27 years. So, again, like, the, the Ottomans were basically like, you know, I mean, like the Romans, you know, in the sense of like, we're not gonna kill you, we're going to be one. You know. Just that whole emphasis on justice, harmony, order. Like, I mean, like the Ammon army, they had these strict, um, just the way they fought too. I'm not saying they were superior and whatnot. I'm just saying they, they fought in a way. It was like, you know, you have cavalrymen and depending on who they were and what they did, they were assigned roles basically. It was combined arms tactics before, you know, people started having machine guns. That's, that's all the Ottomans did. You send out the cavalry, you hit at the enemy, Rattle them up a bit. You pull, you try to pull the enemy towards your center line, and then basically you separate your left and right flanks. Your center line is basically cannons chained to each other, and wagons chained to each other, wagons and cannons. And between the spaces, you basically had janissaries, conscripts, um, 
volunteers armed with muskets supporting that center line hailing out musket fire and bow you know arch uh, you know bow, bow arrow fire just giving everything they have at the enemy and basically the idea is the enemy breaks at this wall and then once they break that's when you send in the cavalry from the center the left and the right and then you just send out a general charge so it was nomadic cavalry with a center line of musket men that's how the ottomans fought what are they called the jazir rifle or the the jezebel the Janissaries? Yeah, the rifle, the name of the musket they use. The Jezebel? Um. Why not no, the J? It was like, uh. I think they were. Let me check if they were matchlocks or flintlocks. Ottoman firearms. Because that was the thing about the Ottomans. Basically, they did what the Romans did, which was nothing special in and of its own. But the fact that, you know, they also had guns. They had gunpowder just to shove the Giselle. point. Giselle. Giselle. Let me see here. I'm thinking of, yeah. Firearms and artillery. Just... Tufek. Tufek. I mean, that's what we called them. Tufek. It's still what it's th like muskets, rifles. We called them to fix. Hmm. And, um, let me check. It's just showing me guns, guns, guns. I don't want artillery. Give me guns. We used a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing about us was like we had a core, armor core, armory core. Like, their whole job was to basically, yeah, the quartermaster course. It was a thing, there was a thing where, back in the early days of the Janissaries, because they weren't recruited from kids yet, you know, they were still, they could still go rogue. So it was like, for every 10 Janissaries, they would have 14 guards. And... As a general rule, which still continued even when they started recruiting from, you know, younger members, um, that it was it was a rule that Janissaries were brought to the battlefield unarmed. Like once they were brought to camp, and once they were about to head into combat, that's when they were given their weapons. That's when the armory was open. The armory tent was open. That's when they could arm themselves, basically. But up until that point, they were, you know, even when they were on the march, they were not armed. Because one, back then, you know, they didn't want them to, like, get rogue. It was that fear. But the second thing was that it ended up making things much more efficient. It basically, it's the, the same thing that we do now. It's like, you know, just... Just organization, basically. You have a core that takes care of all the weapons, all of the, uh... Of everything. Oh, Miklet? Miklet, right? Is that what you were talking about, Miklet lock? Um... No, I, I was thinking of the Giselle, but I could, I, I could have just been wrong. The Giselle might Giselle. be from different, uh... I think the Jezel oh, might be more like right. Afghan. Oh dang! All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it has that look. Yeah, Jezel. Um. Yeah, they were simple, cost-efficient, and often handmade long arm, commonly used in Central Asian parts of the Middle East in the past. The popular among Pashtun tribesmen. Yeah, it was back in the day when. Yeah. They were basically made and made. Yeah, and made. Guns. Yeah, they were probably like the. Yeah, they were. Yeah, these were like probably the the remnants, the descendants of the old Middle Eastern matchlocks. The 
That's the Jezeel. Then there's Jezair. Giselle's pretty much exclusive to Afghanistan. We had like... Hmm, what did we have? Pretty much like that same look, but just pimped out. Just freaking inlaid with like... Have you ever seen like a guitar with Mother, uh, Mother of Pearl inlays? Uh, I think so, yeah. Mother of Pearl. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's. Yep. Yeah, that's search rifles for you. Here you go. Like, that still gets me. That box, like. Um, but. And then just the, the pimp. Oh, yeah, these are it's all so embroidered, pimp. yeah. Oh, pimp. It's so fucking... And this is like... This is from like the... It's from 1750 to 1800s. Mm -hmm. Like, so... But that's... It is what it is. I mean, I was like... When I first found this out, I'm like, why am I not surprised? <laughs> I love it. But that was the idea. It's like the, these were Janissary rifles, so the idea was like to show, yeah, these fuckers are not kidding. Yeah, Kulu, Jatagan, maces. We used a fuckload of maces. And then, yeah, we were like the army was like the. We were also like the first to use bomb bombardiers. Grenadiers, basically. Because mm. we got grenades from the Chinese, and then we were just like, dude. Dude. Mm. Dude. Mm. We mm. could totally do this. And then they went even further. They started using grenade launchers. Fucking launchers. Got Cray. Oh, yeah. That's quick. Yeah, I think I'm gonna head out too. Oh, uh, you're going out for the night? Alright. He's not really steak. Yeah, I can't enjoy your Philly. Philly stick guy. Probably going to Filler! bed soon. Probably upload the video now, because it also it takes probably as, as long as it took to record. It'll probably take at least that long, not more to upload. So, yeah. And for those and for those who end up listening to this uh, upload, uh, I hope you enjoy it all. And uh, once again, do forgive me for yeah, my uh, history lecture. Between. Yeah, not story time. It's history lecture with Jack. History lecture. I mean, <laughs> what do you want a story time? What do you want? What do you want me to call it? It's. I mean, it's a little bit of both. I mean, again, it's depending on my memory, what I can remember, and what I look up. EI yeah, so gamer always, story always, time edition. Everything. History lecture with yeah. Jack. Yeah, like that. That's what I do. I'll have like a, a cool. Yeah, yeah. Work in progress title, but yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that's part. That's what I'm planning on going. With. Right on. And I, I reckon, like, with, uh, as the days go by, I'll, I'll be better with, uh, talking and playing at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Most definitely. Most stuff. Anyways. Alright, peace, my guy. Until next time. Peace, peace. Good weeks. To Philly! Good plan, yeah. Enjoy your Philly. <laughs> Philly! Anytime, my guy. Anytime. Philly! you for uh, watching twitch uh, i'll be back uh, tomorrow morning around uh um what do we call it well now if i sleep for eight hours time uh we'll say we'll say around 10 then maybe early maybe all right peace
R N A N 